So I have my uh, computer hooked up to the screen. Like, oh no, I gotta make sure I wipe out all my inappropriate material before it flashes in So if uh, you have a question, you can raise your hand and then he can uh Thankfully, and luckily, because uh, 
it's a dream of mine since I was a kid to be able to work on these characters that I love to read and, and watch on TV as cartoons as well. So my first favorite cartoon was Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. That's when I was, you know, three years old, four years old, or whatever, and that's how I started drawing. So usually I like to go through some of my childhood art and I'll kind of show you some pieces of art through my career to start off, and then we'll field some questions, maybe do some demos. Uh, come on, work with me here. I just asked me this. So when I was in middle school, so this was when I was, I think, seventh or eighth grade, I would do uh, a lot of realistic, I tend to do realistic portraits, so I'd draw baseball players a lot, because that was my favorite sport. And then I would actually sell that to my friends and teachers in school. So they'd pay me anywhere from five to thirty dollars, and I would just draw these big, these are poster size color pencil drawings. And uh, you know, I, I was really in a phase where I wasn't drawing too much comic books. This is Madonna. <laughs> Some of you guys don't don't know. And uh, I would just practice realistic things. But as part of my growth as an artist growing up is not just drawing one style of art comic books or cartoons, but branching out, trying to do color, trying to do realistic portraits, because they all kind of complement each other, and they will help me down the line in the future. Uh, you know, Kirby Puckett, a Minnesota so, you know, that's where I'm from, Minneapolis, Minnesota, that's where I was born. But I travel all around the country doing shows. This is my uh, middle school, Nicola Junior High, and I did the, the cover, uh, which is funny because I actually, like, copied that eagle from a t-shirt. So it was kind of a scam how I got the cover. Because I mean, if you look at the eagle and then you look at the background mountains, look how bad the mountains are. So you know something was off. This is when I was sixth grade, I believe. So I was about 12 years old, maybe 11. And uh, that's when the Ninja Turtles were getting really hot. So I would, you know, draw some. Most of this stuff is actually not original. These pictures and scans are not mine. These are actually from friends who kept my stuff since childhood reconnected with me as an adult and sent me these pictures. So I'm really thankful for that. Another baseball player from the San Francisco, uh, San Francisco Giants back in the day. Um, so I would do stuff like that. And if we go through, and, and this is just a mishmash of some of my work in my career. Nothing's really in order. Although I will show you my very first job breaking in. And this is from a book called Major Bummer. It's a DC Comics book, believe it or not. And I was 19 when I got hired, but I didn't actually start working until I turned 20. But uh, you can see my name down there in the credits. And instead of saying writer, penciler, inker, colorist, our writer would come up with like really clever, jokey titles for us. But uh, yeah, this lasted 15 issues. Um, like I said, I, I was very lucky breaking into comics. I knew a, a good friend of mine who was already working for DC, and he kind of helped um, network and get me in that way. Uh, but basically, I, I broke in quite young with the mentorship of, of that friend. His name is Doug Mankey now. Some of you guys might know his name. He's a big time artist now for DC Comics, or he has been for a while. He's on the Superman book now. But from there, I went on, speaking of Superman, went on to work on Superman with him. So it's quite a jump to break in from doing a no-name book that got canceled to Superman. So we got lucky, but uh, you know, I, I guess the editors saw that uh, we were doing decent work and took a chance on us, put us on a book, and that really is, this is the book that really kind of broke me uh, open as far as starting to get a little bit of name recognition and starting to do more comic show appearances. And this is back around 2000. So then from Superman to Man of Steel, I went on to do uh, Justice League of America. We did that for a couple of years. And that was great because for me, I got to work on all the big DC characters. Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Batman, Superman, of course, Flash, Martian Manhunter. We even had Plastic Man in the corner. Um, who didn't make it to the big movie that's going to come out, but that's okay. Um, and then from there, I just started. Uh, here's another. Here's another shot of Major Bummer. 
The Winter Bummer is basically a, a story about like a like a, a slacker, like a teenage slacker who's got all these incredible, he's inherited all these incredible powers, but he doesn't want to use them at all. He's so lazy. All he wants to do is stay home and play video games. So it's uh, it's kind of a fun slapstick story. My favorite uh, project I've ever worked on. Um, and then from there, I would do stuff like uh, this is just a pencil drawing of one of the uh, Civil War legendary projects I worked on for the card game, Captain America and Bucky. And this, you've seen this on my banner stand on my table, is one of the cards I worked on. So, you see that. Uh, this is an actual painting. This isn't done digital. This is back when I did a lot of airbrush painting. And I used my friends as models to take pictures of them in certain poses, and then I turned them into superheroes. You saw that. You saw that. Um, an assortment of cards that I've done for uh, the Legendary series for Marvel and Upper Deck. In the upper left corner there, you do see that Captain America and Bucky all finished. So that's what it looks like all finished in color. And I just got done doing another one for uh, them. There's an X-Men set coming out later this month. And I drew a bunch of cards for that. Superman, Wolverine. Most of these you can find as prints on my table, by the way. And I want this stuff here. Just random. Oh yeah, well, these are these are. I went to a middle school last year and I did some demos for kids. And they got really excited about that. Just quick random head sketches. They're not really. They don't really care about the how to draw comics. They just want to see me draw. So I just had to appease them as fast as I could in a one-hour classroom span. So, uh, and, and I did all of that on this computer right here, the Microsoft Surface Pro 2. Anyone have any questions so far? We still have people trickling in. This is great. Yes? Um, besides doing other people's stories, can you? Oh, um, thank you. Ian with the microphone. Well, besides on other people's stories, don't you do your own stories too? Uh, what a very good question. Uh, besides doing other people's stories, do I do my own stories? I for my job, in other words, for my work that I have to do to pay the bills, I don't have too much time to do that. If I do my own stories, it's usually on my own time. So most of my time is spent doing other people's stories because that's what I'm hired to do. Uh, usually when I have free time, the last thing I want to do is pick up a pencil and draw my own stories. But I do have a couple things brewing. One is called The Switch. That's the name of a new graphic novel that me and a partner of mine who's also a DC Comics writer and artist. His name is Keith Champagne. And uh, we did a Kickstarter last year that got uh, wildly successful. And that's coming out later this fall, finally. It's a 90-page story about a, uh, about a super villain girl who turns good. So we're looking forward to having that out this fall, finally. And then I have another one in the works that I want to put out in the next year called Old Man Neighbor. <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds stupid. It's because it is. It's, it's like a stupid slapstick comedy. See, I like comedy, I like wacky humor in my stuff. A lot of the stuff I do is just kind of like your typical superhero stuff, maybe more serious, which is fine. I love that stuff, but every now and then I just need to laugh and just have really goofy things to draw. And that's what Old Man Neighbor is about. It's based on my real life experiences with the uh, neighbor that I once had. So it's just really wacky, wacky stuff. Uh, most definitely not for kids, I don't think. But uh, something, something to think about <laughs> down the line. But yeah, if I had more time, I, I, I'd like to do more of my own stuff. It's just a time thing. Good question. Anybody else have any questions? Because if not, I'm going to start drawing. Oh, okay, here we go. Uh, which artists, whenever you came in, which DC artists influenced you the most? Um, the DC artist that influenced me the most is the guy that I mentioned before named Doug Mankey. Be because when I was 15, that's when I met him. He was already a working pro. He had been doing stuff for Dark Horse Comics on a book called The Mask, which they turned into a movie back in the 90s. And they even did a sequel, I think. Did they? I don't even know. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, he, he and I have been working together at DC Comics. I mean, we were a team for about a decade. 
stuff. And I still occasionally work with him and I talk to him all the time. You know, we're supposed to grab lunch next to, next week, hopefully. But uh, he's the one that really, when he was already at Pro Comics, he was kind enough to put up with me as a 15-year-old, bugging him, asking for advice and critiquing my work. So I was really lucky. This is why I advise to young artists who want to break in. And I know that I spoke to a couple already this morning and even a couple yesterday, artists who want to work in comics. Is if you want to get an honest assessment of your work, bring your work and show it to a professional. Going to shows like this, like a Comic Con, no matter how big or small, they'll always have professional artists, usually. Is the easiest way to show your work to a pro and have a pro look at it and tell you what you need to work on and, and what's the next step. You can always show it to your family and friends, but most of the time they're just going to praise you, which is nice of them. They should be as a family. But uh, they might not have the, the same eye as a professional artist would when looking at your work. So that's, that's what I recommend. Any other questions? Making sure my pencil here works. Yes. It's been, it's been my dream to be as good as you. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> I, How do I do that? Well, you know, uh, if you want to be a, as bad as me, what do you want to do? Uh, I always say drawing is like a sport. Because everyone's good at something, generally. Some people might not think they have a talent in anything, but I really do believe everyone is good at something. It doesn't have to be art, it could be something else, but it, it's just like getting good at anything, whether you're writing, whether you're playing a video game, whether you're drawing or playing basketball, it's all practice. And drawing is the same thing. How do you practice drawing? Well, it's easy to practice basketball. You just keep trying to throw the ball up to the hoop or swinging a baseball bat. You just go into the batter's box and take batting practice. With drawing, I always recommend if you want to draw superhero comics, I, I've been saying this forever, you buy one muscle magazine, and you buy one, and this is kind of funny, buy one like swimsuit magazine, right? Something like that. Or, or a Victoria's Secret catalog, you know. Something that's not too inappropriate. And you pick one picture from each magazine. So pick one female figure, one male figure, and you sketch it out really quick every morning. Just don't overwhelm yourself. Just pick one and just sketch it. Now, don't spend forever drawing it. What you're doing is you're just looking at the bodies and you're just looking at shapes and how they connect. So instead of looking at, instead of looking at, uh, let's say, uh, how the, the shoulders and the muscles go, just look at how round the shape is on top, on the corners of your shoulder. Okay. And you know, like your, your forearm right here, don't look at how the muscles are constructed, but try to, try to look at it as I flex as an upside down bowling pin. That's not upside down, it's right side up. Just see shapes. See shapes and remember those shapes. And you'll figure out that if you do two simple sketches a day, nothing finished, just look for shapes, then in a year, if you think about it, you will have done Jeez, what's my math? 365 times two, which is uh, 730, is that right? 730 drawings a year. I'm Asian, I better get that right. <laughs> Let down my entire race now. But uh, I think 730 drawings a year, if you do that for practice. That's a lot of drawing in one year, and you don't even realize that by just doing two simple sketches. You could do it at breakfast in the morning, get it out of the way. If you feel like drawing more, that's bonus. That's your practice right there. So in a year's time, you're going to be 730 drawings better than you were just one year ago. So that's how you practice. You look at photos. The more you draw, you might not realize it, the more you're going to remember these shapes. And before you know it, you're not going to need photos anymore. You're going to be able to pull it right out of your head. So. It's, it's such a simple, cliche thing to say, just practice. But some people really don't know how to practice. Any other questions? How, no? do you, how do you deal with the pressure of deadlines? Where am I looking at? I, <laughs> oh, how do I deal with pressure of deadlines? Monster energy drinks. <laughs> and YouTube. 
Um, this, you know, there's really no easy answer. Everyone kind of deals with uh, deadlines. It's kind of like the grown-up version of doing homework, right? I mean, that's basically what it is. You're not in, I'm not in school, but it's kind of like homework. I have a deadline. I have to do this much by this time. Um, there is pressure. I'm actually dealing with three tremendous deadlines right now this weekend. But uh, and it's two of them are due Monday. But uh, basically, you just have to just have to power through it. I mean, you know, just like if some of you guys will probably have to write papers overnight for school. That's the same thing. I'll just have to not sleep as much, you know, tonight in the hotel room, and just stay up late, or maybe not sleep at all, and I'll sleep on a plane tomorrow when I go back to Minneapolis. So you just have to deal with it. That's the one thing is that you have to have the mental discipline and strength to do it. It's not for everyone. Not everyone will survive the industry. I don't even know how I survived. I've blown deadlines before. I probably will continue to every now and then. But the most important thing is to let the people who work with you know as far ahead as you can where you're at. And if you're not going to make the deadline, just let them know. Just that alone is appreciated. Even though there might be some disappointment that you can't get it done in time. But you know what? You're only human. You can only do so much. I've learned over the years to stress less about it. Um, I used to freak out whenever I had an impossible deadline, seemingly impossible. But, um, you know, I'm not saying that uh, you should uh, take it lightly and just take it easy all the time, but, you know, just try to do the best you can. And if you can't, there's always going to be tomorrow. It's not the end of the world. So, good question. Anyone else? No? Okay, I'm just going to start drawing. And then uh, my, my cohorts back there, John and Ian, will keep an eye out for anyone who has questions because when I'm drawing, I can't look up, obviously. Um, I'm using a stylus on my uh, Microsoft Surface Pro 2, like I said. Right now, the Microsoft Surface Pros, and now they've got more computers, computer tablet hybrids, that with a stylus will enable you to draw and it's pretty cool because if you guys, if you guys have never done this before, these styluses allow you to put, uh, make thick and thin lines just by changing the pressure, just like a regular pen or marker. And the program I'm using right now is called Clip Studio Paint, otherwise known as Manga Studio Five. Don't ask me why they have two separate names. I don't understand it myself. Another popular program is Photoshop, which I also have. Uh, but I like Clip Studio Paint for drawing comics. Photoshop, I'll kind of save for doing more complex things, maybe some coloring. But this thing has pencil tool that I showed you is the brush tool. So this thing can make pencil marks that are a little bit lighter and more gray. Just like that. But usually, see, I'm trying not to uh, to demo the same thing every time I do these things. If I upload it to YouTube, you see like 10 panels and they're all drawing the same stupid Batman head or something like that. Let's try something different here. Um, so when I draw, when I started off drawing, let's put it that way, I would just literally start off like drawing like really tight. Like that, and then like not rough anything in. No, not you know. Some of you guys might be like, "Oh, that's still great," but um, yeah, and it takes a lot of practice to get to that point. But nowadays, I like to rough things in, just stay really loose. And like I said before, just look for shapes. Like I'll start with like the torso. You know, just kind of kind of rough in where I want my arms and head and everything. And as you can see, it's not very accurate at all. All it's, it's doing is just kind of giving me an idea of where I want things. And the beauty about going this loose and rough is if I make a mistake, it's not going to break my heart to erase and start all over. In fact, it's easier to erase when I'm at, the, at this stage as opposed to when I'm drawing things very tight, I've invested so much time and emotion in putting all this detail into it, and then I find out, or I find out I don't have enough room at the bottom of the page for the feet or whatever. I can always change it. 
um, pretty easily at this stage. And I kind of rough in my lines of where I want the eyes, like the eye lines right there, and then the center line right there is going to be where I'm going to align the nose. So this is what I recommend. A lot of, a lot of kids I talk to, they're kind of, they're, they're, uh, Eyes are wide open when I tell them, nope, just scribble it out. And then when, you, when you're happy with your scribbles, where things should be, then you can go in with ink really tight and just uh, do what you need to to add details and finish it off. So this is a superhero, I might put it out there. Let's just make this Superman fun. But they gave him underwear, but I don't think he wears underwear anymore. Such a, that's such an old school way of drawing Superman now. Although there are people who are old school fans and grew up with that. Same with Batman. So I'm using my eraser, because this thing also has an eraser tool. And I'm kind of lightening up my lines a little bit, just to clean it up. And then I'll go in again, second round, and I'll get a little bit tighter. See how everything is kind of lightened up. So it's a really cool, convenient way to draw on the go without all the eraser crumbs, without needing to sharpen your pencil. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the pencil here. And the cool thing is I can pinch and zoom, just like uh, using your phone. And I can get more detail here. No questions so far? <laughs> And see this line here that I drew for the eyes? It's kind of like my guideline, almost like my cheat sheet. So I know that I can kind of draw the eyes there. And I'm still a little scribbly at this point, but uh, I can definitely tighten it as I move along. What time we got here? It's uh, 12.23. Plenty of time. What am I doing rushing? How many of you guys are artists here? Quite a few of you. That explains why you're here. Is my boy Esteban in here? There he is, way back there. He's got a presentation, he's got a screen with some of his animation work later in the day. What time you got that at, my friend? It's five o'clock. Five o'clock. And you're the last one? Yes, sir. What's after me, John? Hello? What's after me? Uh, after you is uh, Caitlin Ashley's uh, face off q and Oh, okay. Uh, face -off. Okay. I'll give him the classic suit because I don't think I've even mastered how to draw his new suit. He's got all these fancy lines in his suit now. I don't. Although I think they went back to simple again. I don't even know what's going on. Shame on me. I'm like uh, in the business. I don't know what's going on. So any of you guys see the new Wonder Woman movie yet? Who has seen it? <laughs> oh, not as many as I thought. I figured like the whole place would see it. Did you like it? Who didn't like it? That's a, that might be easier to see. Uh, you didn't like it? There's a hand back there. All right. 
Correct. So um, when I'm drawing, I tend to have issues whenever we're getting up in the neck and uh, shoulders area, like the dimensions and that kind of thing. So are there any tips for that that you have necessarily? Because I find that after finishing the head, it's difficult to shift downward. Who's talking? I can't see up there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Is that, is that Blake or Jackson? Who are we talking to? Parker. Parker? Yeah. Parker with the Spider-Man head scans. I'm trying to remember people's names this weekend. Uh, sure, I will. Uh, that's why you requested a head sketch. You want to see how I draw the neck, right? Yeah. No. Um, yeah, I'll show you here in just a second as we get closer. Like, well, what's exactly throwing you off? Um. I'm not sure. A lot of the time, the shift down into the arm, and then just like how thick the neck should be compared to head, and a lot, just the dimensions up there tend to throw me off when I'm trying to transfer it to the torso. Okay. So it just it's, it sounds to me like it's mostly a proportion issue. Yeah. You're just kind of knowing what the muscles in the neck kind of do. I'll show you here in a second as I tighten up this Superman. I know that if uh, Esteban back there, if you uh, watch him sketch. He can knock out these sketches like crazy, uh, much faster than I can. Um, he's a big proponent of doing uh, quick life studies. I've seen him work, and it's actually pretty amazing watching how uh, he just pounds them out. Not really, not really uh, much under structure. He just draws, and I know that you instill that into your uh, interns, right? That's the one. And the artist that he hired. And the artist that he hired. So you guys are looking for a job? Go ahead. You can hire me. What is it, 25 cents a, a frame? Or <laughs> it's definitely intern rates. Which beats my rates, actually. Um, do you have any advice for anybody trying to do their own personal comic like you are doing the Switch? Uh, don't do it. Waste the money. The time. Uh, advice as to doing something on your own. That's a good question. Uh, if you have like your own stories you want to tell, the best way to do it, a lot of companies these days, they don't really want to deal with other people's creations unless you're well known or well established or you're a celebrity. If you're a celebrity, like say like in acting or something, you can get any book you want. But uh, if, if you're just wanting your, to show your own characters, I think now is one of, it's probably the best time to be a creator because you have the internet. When I was growing up, we didn't have the internet. Uh, I lied, we did, but it's not as advanced as it is now. And Definitely social media was not a thing when I was a kid. So the only way to get your name out there was to get published by a company, and then when they advertise the book that's coming up, they would advertise your name. Now you can be your own, uh, uh, do your own PR, your own marketing, your advertising, and you can actually go and get your own Facebook page, do your own website, uh, Twitter, Instagram is huge last few years. I've gotten jobs through Instagram. And if you, it's great because it's a visual medium, so anytime you upload something to Instagram, you have to throw up a picture. Usually for me as an artist or for a photographer, it's pictures of your art. And if you're a writer and you have artwork that goes along with your stories, you can throw up artwork from there. But uh, my advice would be to start, to, to put your work out there and gain a following. It, it's going to take some practice and persistence because you're not going to gain a following overnight, especially if you've never had one. No one knows who you are, but that's the thing. The internet allows you to show your work off because if you don't do it, how are people going to find out about you and your stories? 
So that's a good way to get a following. Because what's the point of telling your story? You don't want to just tell a story because it's just for you, or maybe you and your mom. You want people to read it. You're a storyteller, you're a creative person, you need to get that out of your system. So try to promote online, try to throw up snippets of your story and your characters online uh, if you've gotten that far. And you know, kind of gauge the interest that people have in it. Update them consistent, consistently every now and then. And it's one of the biggest things I've tried to instill in people is be consistent. Like on Instagram, I'm always trying to upload every day. I might miss a day here and there, but I tell you, it's not often at all. So it's, it's almost every day, like if I'm at this show, I'm trying to uh, upload my sketches that I've, I've done during the show. And uh, yeah, you know, you're, you're going to get people who take interest in your stuff, and they're going to start to follow you, and then that's how it all starts. And then hopefully, you know, organically, it'll kind of grow from there. Um, once you get a good enough following, you want to actually publish it as a book. There's two ways. One, you save up the money and do it, but that's kind of expensive to do in a lot of cases. Or you do what uh, a lot of people are doing. They're doing Kickstarters now, the like crowdfunding. So usually they go to their supporters and they're asking for support. And in return, you give them a book or you give them some rewards. Like you send them like limited edition materials and stuff and, or uh, prints and autographed items things that they would not normally get anywhere else, and just uh, see where it goes. If it's successful like my book was for the Switch, and you'll raise a, a good chunk of money, and you can put that towards advertising, and put that towards publishing, you know, touring, and, and everything, and hopefully uh, there'll be enough motivation to do a, a second one and keep going. But there are people who are successful who can make a living doing Kickstarters. Um, you know, YouTube is another avenue that I've been exploring lately. Like I said earlier, this is going to go up on my YouTube channel. And it's a way to... Uh, it, I read that YouTube is the number two biggest search engine platform behind Google. So if you guys have a YouTube channel and you haven't start, started it, that might be something to consider. Now what does that have to do with comic books? Well, you can throw up images and make videos promoting your comic books too. Or if you guys are fancy enough with editing software, you can just make little trailers with still images from your, uh, your stories and books. But that's, that's how I recommend it. It's definitely online. We have another question right here, Tom. Yes? What's your favorite character in comic books to draw? That's a very good question. I get that question a lot. And my answer lately has been, that it changes every single month. Because, uh, I don't know, I see something cool and then I, I really get into it. But my favorite character is Spider-Man, but he's not really my favorite character to draw because of all that, those webs. He's kind of a pain in the neck to draw. But, uh, you know, lately I, I, I've enjoyed drawing. I get a lot of requests to draw like the female characters. You know, make them look really cute and pretty, like. Catwoman or Wonder Woman or Power Girl. Harley Quinn is really popular. Of course, whatever is out in the movies is popular. So I like, right now I like to draw the, the really cute girls. Why, what do you like to draw? I mostly like to draw, um, Flash or yeah, mostly Flash. Flash? Yeah, I get uh, requests to draw Flash all the time at shows. Flash and Green Lantern a lot. I, I get asked about that. It might have something to do with me having worked on a book. But Batman, Wolverine, Wolverine's really popular now because of the Logo movie. Do you ever miss drawing on paper? Um, you know, I do sometimes, but it's one of those things now with the way technology is and the way I'm traveling so much that it's so much more convenient to draw on a tablet. And then uh, when I have, it's one of those things where when I have time and I'm at home, I'll draw on paper. Because the one thing is, 
uh, the original art collecting is really popular now, more popular than ever, and I can't really sell these digital drawings. So um, the incentive is to be able to sell your original art. Um, but it is a hassle to have to bring all that stuff everywhere. You know, like the ink and the pencils and the eraser, all the paper that might get buckled up or bent, you know, when you're traveling. It's just so much easier just to have one tablet and to be able to do everything from there. And the best part for me is I don't have to scan it or find a place to scan it. I can just save it as a file and email it to my bosses. Whereas if I were to work on paper, if I'm uh, traveling, I have to find a place that will actually scan it in high resolution. And then I have to uh, fix the, the file in the Photoshop, like adjust the color or the contrast, make sure it looks great before I can send it. Good question, but basically if I have time at home, I'll, I'll still do paper. I still think that there's definitely a place for paper. I prefer to draw on paper if I can, but it just, just doesn't make sense when I'm traveling. It's not as efficient. What's your thought on the uh, back here in the corner? What's your thought on the copyright issues and kind of the uh, kind of the integrity of you getting credit for what you do versus somebody for screen grabbing it and passing it around? Have you had to deal with that yet? I've seen it happen. Um, I haven't personally had to deal with it because maybe nobody like likes my work enough to rip it off. But it's, I, I've seen it happen with other. I just saw it two weeks ago in San Antonio. Ripping off uh, some guy selling a Superman print that I, one of my friends actually drew. Um, and I took a picture of it and uh, I sent it to him. I haven't heard back yet. Maybe we'll uh, blow that guy up. Um, yeah, it, it's been happening a lot lately. I think it's, it's a scummy thing to do, you know, to, to sell other people's artwork um, without permission. It's, it's, just, it's just bad. It's just, just not, it's not a cool thing to do. <laughs> I, I really can't think of any other positive way to look at that. You know, I mean, if you do your own thing, your own designs, great, more power to you. But you know, just to steal, deliberately steal other people's designs and then profit off of them. You know, it's, uh, the thing is, if they're like small fish and they don't really make a lot of money off of it, can you really, is it worth it to even go after them, you know? It's that type of thing. Uh, I think Parker had a question about drawing the neck here, so I'm gonna let me take a little bit of a segue and do that really quick. I heard it on his shoulder. Okay, so um, the neck. Basically, how I look at the neck. Let's do a couple different views. So if we do like a front view. And say this is the face. Brr. It's mean guy. Now, how thick do you make the neck? Usually, if, if it's going to be a pretty muscular guy, I usually go almost like straight down from the ears. If if it's a real skinny guy, so I mean a lot of it depends on how. Then I do some like that. You can see like the clear difference between the skinny guy, you know, how much less imposing he is. But since we're dealing with superhero comic books, let's give him a thick neck. And like I said, I, I usually go straight down from the ears. And then the shoulders are kind of diagonal down that way. See, I always have these rough guidelines, so I always draw like a center line all the way down the body, and then I'll draw like some horizontal lines to kind of like map out where things are. Um, the standard of measurement, we're talking proportions of the, the figure here. And by the way, I have two books on how to draw comics out. Called Incredible Comics with Tom Noonan, and the second one is Incredible Comic of Women with Tom Noonan. Plug plug, and they have uh, they have charts in there too for drawing uh, proportions. 
So usually the, the unit of measurement that is most often referenced is the head. How many heads tall is this? How many heads long is this? So if you take the head and you go down another head, roughly, this should be, well they say it should be like the nipple level, but it's about the bottom of the chest, roughly. If you go down another head, then it's like where the belly button is. And if you go down another head, it's going to be where the crotch is. Snicker, snicker. So in other words, the upper body from the crotch to the top of the head is four heads long. Okay? So knowing that alone, you can kind of figure out, I'm sorry if this is getting a little sloppy. Parker, you paying attention? <laughs> yes, he did. And that's where you can kind of figure out. A lot of it is you actually have to devote to memorizing these things until they're second nature in your head. Once they're second nature in your head, it's almost like basic math formulas. There's, there's no easy way to remember some of them. You just have to remember them and commit them to memory. So then when you get more advanced in math classes, you can actually pull them up from your head. These are one of those things in art where you just have to memorize these basic proportions so that you can recall them when you're drawing more complicated things. So how I go about it is that one head down is roughly almost bottom of the chest. Now why, why do I even talk about the chest? Well, the reason is because I know that the bottom of the deltoids or the shoulder muscles are higher than the chest. They're not, they're not even with the chest, they're not below the chest. They are higher than the chest. So then when things start to, when you start to put the body together like a puzzle, you can kind of know what is right and what is wrong. Now, you know, we, we won't get into that, well, there's no wrong way to do art. Well, you're right, but you know, you've got to start somewhere. There has to be a standard before you can kind of deviate from it. So as long as you get the bottom of the chest right and you get your shoulders right, everything should kind of fall into place. You just fill in the blanks, fill in the rest. And it'll, it should look fairly close. Now, when we zoom in, we talk about that. So the top of the shoulders, of course, it's always going to be under the chin. It's not going to be level with the chin, right? You don't want your shoulders up here. So it has to fall somewhere between the chest and the chin. But it, you know common sense, it's not gonna be here, because that would give you a draft neck. So then, remember when I drew the straight lines down in the ears for the neck? So then just draw like a 45 degree, roughly diagonal, out to the ends of the shoulders. That's your top of the shoulders, or your traps, your trapezius muscles, what it's called, okay? Now, on the sides of your neck, starting behind your ear, now this is almost like an anatomy chart, like medical anatomy here, is two big thick muscles. They're like two giant ropes that start from behind your ear and they go all the way down in front and they meet right under the chin at your collarbone muscles. So this is your collarbone. Then these are your thick neck muscles that go down. I think they're called, geez, it's been a while, sternomastoids, sternocleidomastoids, whatever. Somebody, I heard someone say it. But whatever, it's the thick neck muscle. And here you have like your, your trapezius muscle, the one that's like kind of on top here, on the side of your neck. That kind of goes down and touches the top of your outside shoulders. So as long as you get these neck muscles right here right, then you're you're basically done. Anything else you fill in, like between, you know, they, like you'll have some like tendons and stuff here that kind of come up and branch out. That's like, you know, you don't need to worry about that too much. That's just filler, filler detail. And you just know where your neck muscles start, which is behind your ear, and where they end, which is right at the, the ends of the collarbone. 
then it's good to go. Like right here in the Superman. My gentle looking Superman that doesn't look that intimidating. So here you can see, and I've kind of like shaded in like lightly, but you can see this is the neck muscle going there, and then on the other side is the other neck muscle. Going right down into the, uh, the collarbone area. The pit of the collar. So if you were to draw it from the side, shapes. 
It's not because those muscles are outlined for your convenience. So, good question. Any other questions? Yes, back there. Um, how did you learn to um, draw weight distribution? Because I have a hard time um, understanding how flesh and muscle react to like gravity in certain situations because when I draw sometimes the form looks very stiff and I really want to work on how things like with like different weights. If you're drawing like a character in like an anti gravity chamber or something, I know flesh moves differently. It's kind of a weird question but um, I just want to see that because I'm also doing animation and it goes into a big effect when the character's moving and if I work on something and it looks super stiff, I just really want to know how I can help uh, change how, oh, yeah, the fluidity of it. Okay. I think what you're asking are probably uh, technically two different questions in a way, but I think the gist of it is you just don't want your, your fingers to look stiff, which is to me more important than trying to analyze little subtle things like weight distribution, which is a whole other animal together. When I talk, when you mentioned weight distribution, I'm thinking more of like how muscles actually change when you're like tightening and moving. And that's very complex because that takes a lot of knowing anatomy and knowing like the origin and insertion of muscles and contraction and extension and all that medical stuff that's not quite necessary. But, um, but what is necessary, and you know, uh, at five o'clock when Esteban does his presentation, since he's Mr. Animator Supreme, he'll probably give you a really valuable input on how that plays into motion. With what I do, what artists do with still drawings, we want to try to show a little bit of that fluid in motion. So, um, I mean, even this Superman is kind of stiff to uh, look at. It. But I always say, look at the big picture. Look at a figure and kind of, instead of seeing individual body parts and trying to move individual body parts, why don't you try to look at the entire figure from head to toe, or if an animal, head to tail, and see a fluid motion? In other words, I could, I could draw like a cat here. A really bad cat. that. And you know, for some people that might be okay, might be good enough, but if I were to redraw that cat from a, a more fluid perspective, and I'll try to knock this out in like two minutes here because that's all the time we have, I'll tr try to look at, break this main body into shape, and usually it's like, it's, it's two shapes. Usually it's like uh, a bigger shape and a smaller shape, and you connect it, those two shapes, and it's almost like a, a peanut or a kidney bean. But if you study a, a cat anatomy you know, and I'm, I'm not no cat anatomical master, I'm just barely competent enough to do it. And then you give it a flow. Everything is a rhythm, a flow. Like S shapes. I always talk about you know S shapes and curves that connect to each other and stuff. Once you start to get that rhythm, then you can actually draw over that rhythm. and use the rhythm as a guide. And then you can actually create figures that are more dynamic and have more flow to it. You know, you can already see the difference between the two cats. I mean, Really quickly, I mean, I could, you know, if you draw, uh, like I say, a female figure, I mean, I mean, then I, you just look for like the center line and the S shape and the floats. Look at the big picture, not the small. You can, you know, you can quickly turn this into. I don't know what the heck I'm drawing here. Maybe a mermaid. 
There we go. So you see the general S shape right there, and then even in the arms I still have it. And then even in the hair, you could have flow and rhythm. But think of the big picture, get those big shapes down, and then you can start to flesh it out. And sculpt it, like a sculptor. And you can see it starting to come together, you can see the dynamic shape of it. And I'm using those big sweeping lines as a guideline to, uh, to map out my figure. And you can do that with just about any type of figure, you know, a person running. Uh-oh, lights are coming out. That is a sign that we have to wrap it up here because you know that uh, Kaylin has a panel. I'm not sure of that. But uh, thank you guys so much for coming. If you have any more questions, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I do have to do that. If you have any more questions, I will be at my table. Uh, just come say hi, look at my stuff, ask questions, and thank you again for stopping by. Have fun today.